Hello and welcome to The Corporate Casket, a bi-weekly series where bad businesses go to die. We will discuss any and everything from bad charities, terrible CEOs, and businesses that have a lot to hide. I'm the Illuminati, and today we're gonna be talking about College Board. Now, this topic has come pretty heavily requested, and I've heard a lot about the College Board, that they are unfair, they're a monopoly, among other things. And obviously in high school, I didn't have a great experience with their tests. So let's dive right in and start with who or what exactly the College Board is. The College Board has actually been around for quite a while, just over a hundred years in fact. I'm sure a ton of my US viewers have heard of them, but even still, you may not be familiar with all their issues. They develop and administer standardized tests, most notably the SAT. The SAT or Scholastic Aptitude Test, according to the Manhattan Review, was created in an attempt to standardize college admission procedures and increase access to higher education. In the later 19th century, it was common for individual universities to have their own admission tests or to grant acceptances to students without testing through certification of specific high schools. Higher education at this time was largely a privilege of the upper classes with only one in 25 high school graduates going on to college. At the turn of the 20th century, college presidents from 12 universities founded the College Entrance Examination Board, which is now simply known as the College Board. These original member institutions were mostly elite universities in the Northeastern United States, such as Cornell, Columbia, and New York University. The organization developed a standardized admissions exam referred to colloquially as College Boards, which was administered for the first time in 1901. This test consisted of essay questions on subjects such as Greek, Latin, and physics, and it took five days to complete. Advanced knowledge of the specific subject matter tested on each administration was available to students who paid a fee to the College Board for this service. The development of the IQ test in 1905 would eventually cause the College Board to rethink its approach to the evaluation of university applicants. World War I era US Army experiments with the IQ test led directly to the creation of the SAT. The SAT has grown over the years and changed quite a bit. Students aren't taking the same SAT tests as students did in the World War I era. Other sources I've found cite the creation of the Educational Testing Service, another company that develops and administers tests on behalf of the College Board, as crucial to the development of the College Board into what it is today. So to try and simplify here, The college testing industry is run by two nonprofits, the College Board, which develops the SAT, PSAT, and AP curriculum, and ACT Inc., which administers the test of the same name. The Educational Testing Service, ETS, was created in 1947, in part by the College Board itself, and is now contracted out by them. Still with me? I know it's a little bit messy, but needless to say, the College Board is sort of the trunk or maybe the root of this college testing family tree. But anyway, now that I've got that out of the way, let's get into why people aren't so thrilled with the College Board, one controversy and criticism at a time. One major criticism of the College Board is that it has consistently and for a very long time put lower income families at a disadvantage, not just in the cost of the tests themselves, though we will get into that, but in other ways as well. One article from CNBC states, in a 2013 paper titled Race, Poverty, and SAT Scores, researchers Ezekiel J. Dixon Roman from the University of Pennsylvania and John J. McArdle from the University of Southern California found that wealthy students earn higher SAT scores compared to their low-income peers, and that the difference in SAT scores between high and low-income students was twice as large among black students compared to white students. According to the Washington Post, in 2014, students from families earning more than $200,000 a year average combined score of 1,714, while students from families earning under 20,000 a year earned a combined average score of 1,326. A 2015 analysis from Inside Higher Ed found that in each of the three parts of the SAT, reading, writing and language, and math, the lowest average scores were among students from families who make less than 20,000 in family income, while the highest averages were among students from families who make more than $200,000. 
Inside Higher Ed reports that the biggest gaps were on the reading section in which students with family incomes below 20,000 earned average scores of 433, while students with family incomes above 200,000 earned average scores of 570. There are multitudes of reasons for this, and I can't blame the College Board entirely for this problem and the struggles students and young adults face to break out of poverty. Wealthier school districts will typically have more support for students, better access to tutors, prep classes, etc. For fairness sake, I will point out that only a quarter of PSAT exams were paid for by students' families last year, so that test prep is widely available free of charge. But the point isn't simply one single test prep, but the after-school help and the consistent quality of education along the way. That's why Anthony P. Carnevale, lead author from the report Born to Win, Schooled to Lose, states to succeed in American, it's better to be born rich than smart. And call me cynical here, but I don't exactly disagree. To some extent, the College Board has even conceded in recent years that the SAT is really a measure of accumulated advantage, which should not be used without an understanding of a student's community and family background. Though they haven't stated this directly, there's been a lot of criticism in the past year or so because of their adversity index. So before we get any further, let's get into this development since it relates to the theme of putting people at a disadvantage. Their adversity index was meant to be a tool designed for admission officers to view a student's academic accomplishment in the context of where they live and learn, said a spokeswoman for the College Board. The Environmental Context Dashboard, as it's called, doesn't provide information about the student. It provides information about the student's environment. It puts a student's SAT score and other academic accomplishments included in their college application in the context of where they live and learn. And at first that doesn't seem like a bad idea, right? Like rather than try to place every single student across the country against the same set of standards, they could say, hey, this is how this student did in their district or against their direct classmates. The number one student in a school that doesn't have reliable resources might be an average student in a school that has resources and more test prep available. So again, at a glance, maybe this could be useful information. Well, Kaplan Test Prep conducted a survey of admissions directors and asked them if they supported or opposed the adversity index. 14% strongly supported it, 24% somewhat supported it, 4% somewhat opposed, 2% strongly opposed, and 56% said they didn't know. The survey also asked if admissions directors plan to use the test. Definitely yes got 3%, probably yes got 15%, probably not got 17%, definitely not 13% and too early to tell 52%. Those aren't great numbers. Even if I can see where the too early to tell percentile is coming from, the lack of faith in the college board seems really apparent to me by this survey. Their original plan faced such heavy criticism that before it was even released, their environmental context dashboard needed changing. David Coleman, CEO of the College Board said, we listen to thoughtful criticism. He added that landscape, as the system is now called, provides admissions officers more consistent background information so they can fairly consider every student no matter where they live and learn. The changes are the system will be called landscape. While the previous system provided one score summarizing information about the student's high school and neighborhood, the new system will provide separate scores on neighborhood and high school. The scores will be available to students, not just to the colleges to which they are applying. Even though it might be good that the College Board did to some extent listen, I'm not really convinced that this is as effective as they think, even with the changes. Robert A. Schaefer, Public Education Director of the National Center for Fair and Open Testing, endorsed the College Board's decision to listen to the critiques of what he called a simplistic score, but said it still fell short. The revised program, he said, doesn't do enough to help disadvantaged students make it into college. In order to diversify a student body, Schaefer said, admission offices should aggressively recruit in underserved areas and make more scholarship money available to applicants who need it most. The shift in the landscape program doesn't eliminate any hurdles, Schaefer said. In reality, it just provides a bit more information to put the hurdles in context. He also stated in the Mercury News that the real problem is reliance on the test reinforces old structural biases in our society and gives a leg up for kids who already have advantages. And this is coming from someone who is a director on fair test. It's part of Schaefer's job to be sure tests are, well, fair. So it's a breath of fresh air to hear someone in that position say reliance on SATs is a bit much. Because the system is so new and so many SATs were canceled due to the pandemic anyway, I don't think I can speak on if it has reinforced biases or not. 
The point here is that it's done little to tackle the heart of the issue. That's been pervasive throughout College Board's history, but we've only just gotten started. We haven't even gotten to the good parts yet. So let's get to some numbers and discuss just how profitable this supposed nonprofit really is. And let's just take a quick moment to thank today's sponsor, Audible. Audible is the leading provider of spoken word entertainment all in one place. At Audible, you can find the largest selection of audiobooks, ranging from bestsellers and new releases to memoirs, languages, businesses, motivation, and much more. And with their newest plan, Audible Plus, it gives you full access to their popular Plus catalog. So now you can listen to all you want, thousands and thousands of popular audiobooks, original entertainment, and podcasts. I'm just getting started on a new audiobook literally this morning called Trampled by Unicorns, Big Tech's Empathy Problem and How to Fix It. I'm not gonna lie, I picked it because I was like, hmm, Trampled by Unicorns, that sounds absurd, let's take a listen. And so far, my understanding from the overview of what I've heard already is it's taking a look at Big Tech's failure to keep promises that they've made and just how inhuman the industry has become and how this has even happened. I think it's a fantastic listen so far, so if you want to listen to the this audiobook as well, you should definitely take a look at trying Audible. So if you wanna get started today, make sure to visit audible.com slash casket or text casket to 500-500 to sign up for Audible today. Again, that's audible.com slash casket or text casket to 500-500. College Board charges for their tests, of course. They need to pay for the paper it's printed on, the people that administer the test, fine. Nonprofits can't use 100% of the donations on their cause unless their CEOs and workers are fine with working for free. I get that, and I get why College Board does have to charge something for these tests. As of March, 2019, Vox wrote, it charges $47.50 to take the SAT, $64.50 with the essay portion, and $22 for each of the SAT subject tests, not including a $26 registration fee. The ACT costs $50.50, $67 with the writing portion, and for each test, there are extra costs for late registration. Advanced placement AP tests cost $94. Fee waivers are available, but considering most college counselors suggest students take these tests multiple times, odds are many students and their families are paying hundreds of dollars just to be considered, turning college testing into a billion dollar industry. So yeah, it's not cheap. I remember being in high school and I'm pretty sure my high school counselors were like, no, you have to take this test like two or three times. You gotta take it once to like test it out and then you gotta do it like two more times to make sure you get it. And that's insane. And that's also not cheap. But again, if they were just breaking even or even a for-profit company, you probably wouldn't hear me complaining. Unfortunately, their status as a nonprofit is questionable for a few reasons. In 2017, College Board made $1.067 billion off of students paying for those courses. Over $1 billion. Did I say that? One billion with a B. I know when we think of companies that make a ton of money, it comprises companies like Nestle and Herbalife, those kinds of companies come to mind, but holy shit, these numbers are huge. And according to what Nonprofit Explorer has posted based on their own forms and numbers, their functional expenses were $927 million. They had a surplus of $140 million. So they use that money to help students that may not be able to afford the test during the next testing cycle because that's what a good nonprofit does and everyone cheered. That's sarcasm. I'm kidding, but it would be nice to see that, right? Well, uh, sorry to disappoint you, but those surpluses actually go to the executives and the fat cats right at the top of the tippy toppy chain. This isn't new, of course. One 2013 article from Patch reads, in 1999, the college board was facing cash flow problems. So it recruited Gaston Caperton, former governor of West Virginia, to transform the nonprofit company into a thriving business. 14 years later, the college board holds a complete monopoly over the test taking industry. Although it does have one competitor, the ACT, many students are still required to take an SAT subject test in order to apply to certain schools. And all students wishing to earn college credit for an advanced placement class must take the corresponding AP exam, which the College Board creates. Therefore, it makes sense that its profits are 317% of the industry average and its former president, Mr. Caperton, earned 444% of the industry average at compensation of $1.3 million last year. Its newly chosen president, David Coleman, will earn a base salary of $550,000 with a total compensation of nearly $750,000. Additionally, College Board's 23 executives make an average of $355,271 per year. 
these high salaries are extremely suspicious. If the college board truly wished to create testing equality for everyone, wouldn't it pay its executives less and instead use those profits to lower the cost of the SAT for all? Why is this company considered a nonprofit if its motives aren't completely altruistic? The College Board is capitalizing on the perceived and exaggerated importance of the SATs, said Bob Sweeney, an experienced guidance counselor. Indeed, the College Board will tack on all kinds of extra fees for certain services, including the rush order, exam date changes, and the question and answer service. On the College Board website, the company even attempts to sell all sorts of products, including the official SAT study guide for $31.99. Although the SAT registration cost itself can be waived for low-income students, the costs of these special services are not, giving high-income students an edge when preparing for the SAT and completing college applications. It's becoming questionable whether the College Board is, in fact, dedicated to an equity agenda of expanding access to higher education for the poor, African-Americans, and Hispanic. This is still a quote, by the way, back to this. If the College Board truly wanted to create an equal testing experience for everyone, it would offer all of these extra services for free to those who cannot afford them. Does it really seem fair that one student can afford an SAT study guide produced by the test maker while another cannot? Those students with the right amount of money reap the benefits while the others are left in the dust. Man, I gotta say I am in the wrong business. Should have been a College Board executive. They make buttloads of money, my God. Bloomberg even wrote an entire article about how the head of the college board whose compensation has tripled since 1999 gets paid more than Harvard's leader. And hey, if someone owns a business and runs it and takes care of their employees, by all means, take home a good salary. But this is a nonprofit. Weren't nonprofits supposed to be, well, you know, not about the profit? I'm not saying the head of the college board should not get paid or compensated fairly, but when they have this much money left over and he was already making boatloads and then they just kind of cut it up and then just serve it to each other, like that's gross. I have no idea why they have such a fantastic reputation on Charity Navigator, while NPQ Nonprofit Quarterly questions if they're a Nino, a nonprofit in name only. NPQ published back in 2012 that writing for The Atlantic, former teacher John T. Tyranny takes on advanced placement courses, the purportedly college equivalent high school courses that we all want our kids to take and ace. Ultimately, his concerns get to the question of whether the college board, which most people know for its SAT and PSAT tests, is really operating as a nonprofit at all. Tierney, who is not to be confused with U.S. Representative John F. Tierney, calls AP courses one of the greatest frauds currently perpetuated on American high school students. He listed off a number of issues with AP courses, from not being remotely equivalent to college-level courses to rigid stultification, a prescribed plan of study that squelches creativity. Tierney argues that the College Board may be a bit thin in its nonprofit DNA. He cites Americans for Educational Testing Reform's criticism of the College Board's profit margin. The organization gives the College Board a D grade. AETR's position is that the College Board and two other major testing organizations, ETS and ACT, should have their nonprofit status repealed. Among AETR's complaints about the College Board? Political lobbying to expand its monopoly, its massive profits, and its exorbitant salaries paid to executives. The latest numbers on the College Board show total compensation for Gaston Caperton, who was scheduled to step down as the organization's president yesterday at $1.45 million, well more than twice the compensation of the organization's second highest paid executive. To Tierney, it's clear the College Board has the mentality of a voracious corporation, but do its growth, profitability, and executive compensation levels really make it a for-profit? Now, this obviously isn't the worst we've ever seen from a nonprofit by any means, but what makes the College Board such a frustrating case is, well, there's no alternative. As Tierney touched upon, the College Board is pretty much a monopoly, eating up all that college prep cash without leaving room for anyone else in the space. So let's get into that piece of the College Board controversy now, the monopoly. The College Board monopoly is multifaceted. There's a ton of different reasons why people take issue with them being essentially the only option available to students, but I'm going to try touching upon a few of the big ones and how their influence has become what many as see is out of control. National Review stated in October 2014 that the College Board's decision to create a new, unprecedentedly detailed and ideologically slanted framework for its AP US history exam has touched off a political and cultural firestorm. 
I and other critics have charged the College Board with building a strong leftward bias into its revised version of American history. Controversies have erupted between the College Board and school boards in Texas and now in Jefferson County, Colorado. The issue is spreading nationally. While resolving the AP US history controversy will be difficult, the solution is straightforward. We need to break the College Board's monopoly on advanced placement testing. The College Board's monopoly hasn't been a problem up to now because institutions for the various AP courses have traditionally remained brief. Until this year, for example, coverage for the AP US history exam was detailed in a five-page topical outline. This outline merely listed subjects to be included on the exam, leaving teachers free to present US history from a variety of perspectives. Personally, I'd want a teacher to present history and facts as well as opinions that were held at the time for those involved in whatever dispute may have been happening and then leave it there. One of the reasons I even like learning so much about history now is because I had such shitty history teachers growing up and they didn't really teach me anything. So I'd have to go out and learn it on my own. So if College Board is politicizing history by saying this president is bad as opposed to explaining their policies and then letting the students come up with their own opinions, then yeah, I agree with the National Review on that one. But as I've said, this is far from the only article calling them a monopoly and calling them out. The student post said in 2017, as of 2018, each AP exam cost $94 to take with the price rising by a dollar or two each year. In 2016, a total of 4,704,980 AP exams were administered by the College Board to high school students. That adds up to over $425 million in revenue strictly from AP exams. Sadly, no alternative organizations are able to compete with the College Board's AP program. There is international baccalaureate, but only 1,680 schools across the United States offered this program in 2016, compared to the 21,953 that offered AP the same year. The College Board also dictates what information is taught in AP classrooms, as well as how it is taught. The control over high school curriculum can be seen in their course outline for the AP US history exam. Teachers are told exactly what to teach and how to teach it. There are similar outlines for the other 37 AP courses. To avoid backlash from school administrators, educators must teach their students to the exam rather than having the freedom to design their own course. In AP courses, the primary goal is to get as high a score as possible, which is a number between one and five. From what my former AP teachers have told me, many of them are questioned by school administrations at the end of the school year about why their students did not score higher, regardless of how well they actually did. It does not matter how high or low a teacher's students actually scored, they will still be pressed by their administration. Schools having gotten so wrapped up in ensuring that students score well on exams, sometimes they forget to make sure students are actually learning valuable information in the classroom. I can't know if every single teacher has faced this pressure. There are only a few teachers' experiences, but given the teach for the test mentality I've talked about in the past and I've experienced in the past, it seems possible, even probable, that this is the attitude the College Board takes with educators. I understand a guidance being set in place for sure, but if a student makes it to an advanced placement exam, it frustrates me to think that they're going to learn like stuff that's set in stone with zero room for creativity in the classroom. Again, if this wasn't your experience, that's great. And I really hope it's not as common as it's starting to sound, but this really is a problem. Well, you know, just tack it onto the ever growing list that is the College Board. And yet another extremely worrying thing to add to that list is that each test created by the College Board contains a question that asks you if you would like them to connect you with colleges and scholarship programs through their student search service. Many students mark yes in the box, but what most people do not realize is they are actually selling their personal information to colleges. As it turns out, they are not connecting you with colleges out of the kindness of their hearts. Some people might not even care that they are doing this. I, for one, would rather not be misled and have my personal information sold. On their test, they do not explicitly state that they will sell your information and they do not even declare it on their website until you dig deep. The only thing they say is they will connect you with colleges and scholarships. The College Board says they won't sell your student data and yet they also offer a licensing fee for exactly that. On their website, they go on and on about how important privacy is to them, but it's really not. It's really fucking not. And there's no plainer way to say it. As of 2019, they charged 47 cents per name for access to student information. And apparently one of the College Board's customers was Jamars and that's J-A-M-R-S. It's a military recruitment program. What the actual fuck College Board? Now, this was quite some time ago that the College Board was sued over this. In 2013, the Philadelphia Inquirer wrote that, 
Across the country, more than 1.6 million students in this year's high school graduating class, including 101,368 in Pennsylvania and 83,489 in New Jersey, took the SAT. Nearly 1.8 million graduating high school students, including 26,171 in Pennsylvania and 24,202 in New Jersey, took the ACT. The lawsuit says the companies collect details about those students, such as their names, home addresses, birth dates, phone numbers, and social security numbers, and sell it at a price of 33 cents per student per buyer, but at no time disclosed to test takers that their information would be sold. Hell, the College Board has consistently come under fire and been sued for these practices, yet nothing seems to really come of it. Whenever I start to look into or research the College Board selling student data, each article I find about the topic seems to have a different year attached. But we are far from done here because these are far from the only lawsuits they've had. A different lawsuit in 2018 states that the College Board reuses questions. Yep because even with all the money they make, they just can't be bothered to write new test questions. The August SAT 2018 was based on an SAT given in Asia in October 2017. The use of recycled questions became known to the public almost as soon as the administration on the August SAT was over, as reports spread that some students from Asia had taken the test in the United States and may well have had an advantage. The College Board responded as it usually does to such reports by saying that it had good security measures in place and it would block scores of anyone who had access to the questions in advance. The controversy is not quieting. On Thursday in Florida, a class action lawsuit was filed against the College Board on behalf of the father of a young woman who took the August SAT. The father and the daughter are not named and the suit seeks damages on behalf of all those who took the SAT in August. The suit charges that the College Board knowingly went ahead with the use of recycled questions, despite knowing of the security risk the use of such questions creates. The suit notes that Reuters in 2016 published an in-depth report on SAT security problems, with a focus on the way versions of the test leak in Asia, and that these versions contain questions that are later recycled on other tests. So, oh wait, 2016, let me just mark that off my list. In all my articles about their security leaks, I know I had one from, let's see, 2014, 2017, 2018, and 2019, oh, and 2020. But I'm not sure I had a 2016 article, but I think you get the point. For years and years, people have complained about their security and how they sell a student's information. Now, not only is it a giant mess, but they recycle questions too. Yet as of 2020, these are still not their only legal battles. Here's another, brand new and in part thanks to the pandemic. The class action lawsuit filed in federal court in California argues that the College Board, which sponsors the exams, should have done more to anticipate and prevent technical problems with the exams, which students are taking online this year because of the coronavirus pandemic. When the exam started last week, some students across the United States said they encountered technical glitches that prevented them from submitting their exams, though the College Board said this week that less than 1% of students were unable to submit their responses. This line of thinking really pisses me off, especially when it's coming from a company as big as the College Board. Even if a very tiny percentage of students couldn't submit their responses, why make them suffer for it? And in the midst of a pandemic, might I add, just because most people didn't have a problem with technical glitches doesn't mean that those who did should just suck it up. Despite revenues of close to half a billion dollars a year from its AP program alone, the College Board failed to do what was necessary to make its at-home AP exams fair and accessible. This is inexcusable in light of the unprecedented challenges faced by students and their families this year. The student's attorney, Philip Baker and Marcy Lerner Miller said in a statement, the lawsuit claims the College Board ignored warnings that the online test would discriminate against students with disabilities and students who lack access to the digital technology needed to take at-home AP exams. The plaintiffs are seeking damages of more than $500 million and are asking that their answers that they weren't able to submit still be graded rather than being forced to retake the tests. Peter Schwartz, general counsel for the College Board, dismissed the lawsuit as baseless. So is $500 million a ton of money? Yes, will they get it? Doubtful. But is their lawsuit baseless? Absolutely not. If a product you buy from Amazon breaks, you can return it. Big businesses know that. You can return shitty products, even if they work for millions of other people. But how come a nonprofit doesn't understand that, hey, their online test didn't work for a few people and they should listen to and work with those that are struggling to take the test that, you know, they paid for? Bob Schaefer, and there's that name again, good to see you again, Bob, interim executive director of FairTest said in a statement that even if only 1% of students were unable to submit their exams, that at least 20,000 students were affected. 
At least there's one sane person I see cropping up in all of this. After all, if a million people take this test, 1% of a million is still a ton of people. Even after this, I feel like we're only at the tip of the iceberg still. I just can't go over every single issue that every single student has ever had with an AP class or their own personal experience with the College Board, but I'm going to touch on just a few more smaller issues before we close out today's episode. And I don't necessarily mean smaller in terms of importance, just the scale or attention that it received. For one, the College Board has apparently always held a bias towards long essays, regardless of mistakes. And sure, I understand wanting to give a lengthy, well thought out essay a good score, but regardless of mistakes? Back in 2005, the New York Times wrote that Dr. Perlman, a director of undergraduate writing at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, fears that the new 25 minute SAT essay test started in March, which will be given for the second time on Saturday, is actually teaching high school students terrible writing habits. It appeared to me that regardless of what a student wrote, the longer the essay, the higher the score, Dr. Perlman said. A man on the panel from the College Board disagreed. He told me I was jumping to conclusions, Dr. Perlman said. Because MIT is a place where everything is backed by data, I went to my hotel room, counted the words in those essays and put them in an Excel spreadsheet on my laptop. In the next weeks, Dr. Perlman studied every graded sample SAT essay that the College Board made public. He looked at the 15 samples in the score write book that the College Board distributed to high schools nationwide to prepare students for the new writing section. He reviewed the 23 graded essays on the College Board website meant as a guide for students and the 16 writing anchor samples the College Board used to train graders to properly mark essays. He was stunned by how complete the correlation was between length and score. I have never found a quantifiable predictor in 25 years of grading that was anywhere near as strong as this one, he said. If you just graded them based on length without ever reading them, you'd be right over 90% of the time. The shortest essays, typically 100 words, got the lowest grade of one. The longest, about 400 words, got the top grade of six. In between, there was virtually a direct match between length and grade. He was also struck by all the factual errors, even in the top essays. An essay on the Civil War given a perfect six describes the nation being changed forever by the firing of two shots at Fort Sumner in late 1862. Actually, it was early 1861. And according to the Battle Cry of Freedom by James M. McPherson, it was 33 hours of bombardment and 4,000 shot and shells. Given everything we've already heard about the College Board, I can't exactly say I'm surprised but it's so disheartening for Dr. Perlman to say this is exactly what we don't want to teach children, to write as long as possible and use facts, even if you have to make them up. I can't say for certain that the College Board is still grading this exact same way, and I'd love to see Dr. Perlman do another study, honestly, but even if this only affected one year's worth of students, that's potentially a million plus kids. The College Board has also had issues with misscoring tests and worse yet, lying about the severity. I mean, look, I can see a few hundred, even a few thousand tests being misgraded from some computer error. But the appropriate response would be to come clean and solve the issues, whereas the College Board, well, they didn't do that. According to the 2006 New York Times article, they didn't give much explanation at all for what happened to our good friend Robert Schaefer, who called them incompetent for this very issue. These issues and more have been the slow downfall for SAT in recent years. The University of California will no longer use SAT and ACT scores in admission decisions. In the past decade or so, over 1,200 colleges and universities have made the SAT and ACT optional. Personally, I think this is the right way to go. You can't paint everyone with the same brush. Everyone learns a different way, and for colleges to place such a heavy emphasis on the SAT doesn't even start to give a clear picture of what that student could bring to their college. Forbes published a recent article called How the SAT Failed America that I totally recommend you check out for more info if you're so inclined. It was a pretty good read, and it definitely expands a little bit more on what was talked about in today's episode. But with all of that being said, that is where I'm going to end today's episode of The Corporate Casket. I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, make sure that you're liking, subscribed and following so that you never miss a new upload. I upload every Monday, Wednesday and Friday. So thank you so much for making it to another episode and I'll see you in the next one.